you know, the reference. In other words, an object is observable. And carries its observer with it. And I won't try to draw out Danville's scheme, which is better done by looking at the printed paper. It, I'll get it all wrong anyhow if I try. What it amounts to is a notion that objects exist by a certain sort of synchronicity between the observer and the self, which is an information transfer, and um, that these are all accommodated by Gunther. 1961, in discussing von Furster. I've lost the thread just a bit, Gordon. Sure, I I was giving the second example. Oh. Something that isn't, doesn't have an ontology that is accommodated by one of these logics. So I was requested right, to, yeah. give, to give, first of all, an explication of what was meant by this uh, a difference between a TF logic and uh, a logic with more values. So that, indeed, it was simply an example. I first of all gave an example of how, what is meant by referring you to a paper, which I regard as very clear, by Jack Cowan, uh, in which in particular he's trying to show and does show that the expressive power of a lucas average logic is no greater, but, nor is it to any other kind of logic, but that certain modal logics have quite different schemes. Uh, I then introduced uh, an interpretation of this, which you helped a great deal with in connection with possibility value of Lewis logics, and gave an attempted interpretation of this at the top of the sheet. I then went on to my second example, maybe you'd like to label these or something, which is the example of the extension of the Spencer Brown logic, which has, although it's interpreted as distinct and not dis uh, distinct and call. A name to a permission to put a name in a space, which is distinguished, uh, and um, is dealing with the logic of distinction. Uh, it has a value which is ambiguous because f or g, which are Spencer Brown expressions called degrees of the second order, they're equations of the second order, second degree, I forget, second degree, uh, because they contain a one or more reentrances. Of the space into itself. And by re entrance, you mean that? I mean, that, that thing comes around. Uh, this is a boundary to a space. It's simply a way of cleaving. It's a way of writing a cleft between spaces. And certain spaces may contain other spaces. I mean, it happens that one, one of them, or more of them, in the case of G, one of them in the case of F, more of them in the case of G, um, come back around. Then this is interpreted by Spencer Brown as a sort of oscillation fact. And um, it's held quite arbitrarily interpreted because he really introduces a different sort of logic that he doesn't do very well. He simply exemplifies it. It was done in order to accommodate the simple notion of self-reference by Gogan and Varela by using that as a truth value in the logic. And necessarily, incidentally, they should have extended the morphogrammatic scheme, but did not. And uh, Glanville did extend the mor morphogrammatic scheme because his calculus is simply another way of expressing uh, uh, primary Gunther logic. Well, Gunther logic generator, if you like. Now, uh, um, maybe that's enough about logic, but I, mean, I hope it illustrates that indeed, if you're going to simply have many possible, enough enough possible expressive power in a, a logic that a fortiori, a priori, a fortiori has an ontology. And it's not simply a symbol of, I don't know why, switched around or something. Um, then in order to deal with self-reference, other reference, psychiatry, even, even quite simple self-referring things like objects that can be observed. Um, because it seems forgotten that when you talk about an object, there must be an observer. 
in the scheme, well, to do the observing of the object, then you also have to have a logic of much greater expressive power and other values, and hence distribution over the truth values, which are different kinded, as well as the um, distribution of morphograms to give more sorts of truth table that can be filled in with these different values in order that the expressive power of the, the scheme can be somehow explicated in structure rather than simply left in vacuo. Let me ask you one question about the interaction that John focused on with you and Palumbo at the end, which mm -hmm. is the, the, the critical point of that discussion. Obviously, what you mean by saying that Palumbo is probably a brilliant practitioner or a very good mm -hmm. analyst is that some, some interaction is going on in which, which behavior is changing and uh, if you were standing outside the office watching the person go in and come out a series of times you might see a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, so something has happened. Uh, is it, do you think it's right to say that our problem looking at all that and listening to Shlombo describing his sense of his activity is that without a sufficient logic or without it being explicated, his interpretation of the interaction is something like nonsense in, this, in, in the idea that you've got to have some kind of consistent logic to make sense, given what we mean by sense. Yep. So that what we could offer, if one were to pursue the ELISA discussion and with him, is to get diagrammed in some way, whether it was uh, with more boxes and, and lines and domains, mm -hmm. or in a strictly verbal way, mm -hmm. a, uh, some kind of formal explication for him of what he thinks is going on. And that that would be a very good thing to do. If he looked at that, he might not believe that that was really what was going on, because it wouldn't seem to fit the... Correct. And this would be, I think, a very good idea, because in fact, one would be using his own trick, albeit not so well as he'd do it, but his own a trick with which he, is, he is, says he is playing, I'm sure is playing. Uh, uh, and um, it therefore should be very comprehensible, gentlemen, you know, mm -hmm. because indeed it's in his own idiom. I mean, we may not speak it as clearly, perhaps, right. as he does, that, that I'm sure I shouldn't. But the, on the other hand, at least it's an attempt to get into the same language. So we probably... Use the same techniques, too. We probably... We could do that right now. I mean, we could understand what he says and, and extend it, but it would probably be nicer to do that... Better if he was here, because yes. uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure, you see. I mean, I, I learned some things about... and made some inferences. Uh about chat, but I really don't quite know. It would be interesting to have him for another session about taking, taking that on. But it does, if I can jump in with a proposal to pick up last, uh, the last beginning of the session and see it as a, as a continuum, mm -hmm. um, however now related to this experience, mm -hmm. this is very consistent with what I think I would like to very much see happen over the next week or so. And, uh, um, Good. And bring us a message from Heinz, which is consistent with that purpose. I have talked to him about your being here, mm -hmm. and he's been very active in the ontogeny of the new cybernetics magazine, which mm -hmm. would be a home for this sort of presentation. Mm -hmm. So let me read you what he proposes that we he would like to see us do mm -hmm. in terms of sure. your being here and having a kind of interaction. And I'll give you a copy of Thank you. some Xeroxes. I just Thank transcribed you very much. this from a tape. Thank you. Um, he says, It would be wonderful if we could get Gordon's position on the theme of language. A, a past quote, for which he didn't have the exact reference because he'd lent all his books to other people. After the event of language, no cerebral semantic circumstance is ever again outside the pale of linguistic relations. And I suppose that that's an accurate uh -huh. quote. Uh -huh. He says, this is a problem which is very, very crucial and should be taken very seriously. That is, whatever we do will be bound by language. Uh -huh. 
So we cannot reflect about the language less universe because in that very reflection we are already immersed in language. We would like to have Gordon's view on conversational theory based on a notion of language. Uh -huh. And we would like to have a linguistic theory based on the notion of conversation. Okay. Now you see, they bite into each other's tail and one can tackle it uh -huh. now from the two ends. Yeah. From the conversational theory point of view and from the linguistic theory point of view. And if that appears in the discussion, it would be extraordinarily helpful to see Gordon's position on that. Uh -huh. Again and again, if you could keep in the language direction, that would be the most important thing at this juncture today. That's sort of consistent with what uh -huh. all of us have been talking about and the reason we've been saying that we should probably begin the cybernetics rebirth with a series of different ways of looking at language, whether it was from the machine domain and natural language and semantics, uh, whether it was problems of translation or notation or all the other things we've talked about. And so I'm proposing that we try to keep that filter on all of our continuing discussions and that we maybe, if we were going to have a name for this series of uh, seminars and for this issue of a magazine, it would be called The Language of Gordon Pass. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, but that we include all, all the, the uh, directions in, in which we go, many of which may seem astray, uh -huh. within the framework of that okay. basic point that the real contribution perhaps we can make is to what is your work telling us about language and how we're using it, and that's very, very consistent with your digression about Gunter mm -hmm. and its possible applications. If we can explicate that and bring it back always towards what is the case for language, what are we learning about this experience of uh, speaking? Does that make Either sense? speaking or Heinz, of course, means language or generally. I mean, he'd be the first to agree, for example. That mime, gesture, the rituals of physics are linguistic uh, as much as spoken language that um, languages are real in the sense that uh, one isn't discussing what is often called badly formal linguistics because a formal linguistics to my mind should be a formalization of a formalization of, of language which is a many faceted dual a jaw with many, many faces. Mm -hmm. um, these um, faces are often obscured by using pop terms like formal language to suggest formalization of some symbol system which bears a resemblance to formalization of a programming language or something even less uh, elaborate, uh, which may be very elaborate computationally or may have a great deal of so-called expressive power in the hands of people who have also incidentally designed computers. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it's particular to these devices that design the culture in which they were designed and so on. And in itself, computer language is no more a language than a piece of uh, written down signs and paper. Uh, without interpretation of any sort, without any without any epistemology. It is an arguable point as to whether or not a logic induces an ontology, but certainly epistemology has a logic, very primitive, but logic again in the broadest sense of the word, and constitutes a semiotic field, i.e. something of a pragmatic uh, a syntax, you can call it expressive power, morphograms, and Gunter K. Mm -hmm. Or, or, and uh, a thing called an interpretation, which Gunter research should be induced, i.e. The, the things or realities which are necessarily denoted, the sorts of reality that are necessarily denoted by a logic with that expressive power, otherwise the expressive power is not used. Um, and languages are, are of this kind, and when it comes down to them, they're, they're languages certainly which refer to, they, they certainly accommodate, encompass any cerebral or whatever event and comes into the pale of language, sure. 
It's not to say that uh, they don't do that, because indeed the thing is self-referential and comes back in the end to the notion of self-reference. Uh, that, uh, of course, indeed the language has to have self and other reference. It has, has to have addressing attached to it. And it, it has to have, in other words, it would have no pragmatic section. Eh? And it has to have something like an intent attached to it. Now, it's quite convenient to agree to say a formal language or something because it looks like attempted formalizations of natural language as spoken usually or even of uh, choreography as choreographed or dance as choreographed or whatever or done equally um, because it happens to look like that to call it you know, it, it wouldn't look like a formalization of these things. It, it, it is it's called a formal language. It is no such thing unless you take into account the entire computer culture and the <coughs> ballpark in which these contraptions that accept this code, it's code. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a code. A, I mean, it's code. It's not a language. It's a computer language is code, which may be more or less formalized. Uh, it's formalization of a code. Formalization of a code looks very much like the formalization of many formalizations, which are trivial uh, in their incompleteness, not in their power, not in their profundity, but in their, well, sorry, it's in their profundity, they're in, in, in inadequate. Uh, quite inadequate in their profundity. They're very, very elaborate, very clever, very ingenious, and very beautiful. But they're not profound enough. <laughs> they haven't really looked what language is, or at least they have put it aside. And the beautiful analysis does not apply to the, to the phenomenon of language. Uh, hence, it is capable, it's possible to establish a one one correspondence between the sort of formalization which is done for computer languages, for example or descriptive languages, for example, uh, uh, and the formalization which is done for natural language, because the formalizations I know of natural language, a couple of exceptions, do not attempt to deal with the phenomenon, really. That is left informal, very informal, mm -hmm. and often forgotten, because people get so tied up in manipulating these beautiful symbol schemes, and they are actually talking about the code-like aspect of language, right. which, is a, which is its appearance, its syntax, and so on. And um, they go to... Mm, yeah. uh, yes, I mean... Uh, Noam Chomsky pays a a great difference. Uh, and the guy before him in Chicago, what's his name, who did the phrase structure grammar, what's the in that champ's name? The first guy to come up with phrase structure grammars, Chicago. Before Chomsky's transformational stuff. Can you remember, John? Um, in Chicago? Yeah. University of Chicago, he was there um, <clears throat> and did the first paper, yes, on phrase structure grammars, production yeah. schemes, unordered production rules, and a Turing machine or something. Mm. Well, he's the originator, in fact, of the phrase structure part, and Chomsky added essentially syntactic structures elaborated that and put in a transformational rule and is talking essentially and says he's talking about syntax and this, this becomes terribly plain because there is a, a very be a beautifully illustrative series my favorite example and i'm probably repeating it but this is, it is a good example i think of a series of papers which occupy the handbook of mathematical psychology a learned tome collection of the best in the field. Um, about half of volume two, which is longer, if I recall it, than volume one, and they're both pretty large, is devoted to a number of papers by Chomsky and Miller, which are partly about transformational schemes and partly about the utterances possible of various sort of writing schemes. Now, this is the handbook of mathematical psychology. 
Mathematical medical psychology, to all appearances, is chiefly concerned with this very large section, okay, or the first volume, which is mostly occupied by CFEs and um, and uh, Estes and um, a few others on on statistical learning theory, whatever that is, it doesn't seem to be very much. Appears to be possible to do what Heinz once said. You know, you have two large finite state machines. You attach the tail of one to the head of the other, and uh, you may uh, you have now stated learning theory, a rather more uh, generous form than is usually allowed. But on the other hand, you've stated it. Um, now. All right, I can predict what this would do perfectly well. I would want to say how rapidly it does it, how many states it's got, whatever. How, how often it goes into a state or something. Yeah, we could probably do that. What happens if I do? Would it be of any use? Well, it would be if I was training rats to run a maze, maybe, I don't know. And the rat was identified with this contraption. Uh, and the maze was part of one of its, turning the maze in one of its states. Um, maybe it would, I don't know. And it might be if I was concerned with how long in ergonomics it takes to form a certain action or to acquire a particular little bit of a skill. But um, exactly what is said about psychology? As far as I can see, nothing. Now, this apparently was a state of mathematical psychology. It is a state of quite a lot of it still. And I emphasize mathematical. This is not loose psychology. This is the very quintessence, the very best of scientific psychology, and it's very contemporaneous with the, the handbooks of psychology of the science. Um, a psychology of the study, a study of the science, uh, which are, of course, excellent and contain a variety of contributions. Um, some of which I think are pitiful, others of which I certainly do think are pitiful. Like, for example, Harlow's work on error factor theory is certainly not pitiful. It's very interesting. Some of the work on perception is, is extremely good. It contains a repeat, of course, all the various learning models with different thetas and gammas and so forth in them, uh, and different places to put things where you put them in the exponent, you put them down in the subscript underneath, you fiddle around with the equation to give it one form or another, well, it was great. And it would be fine if this had any psychological relevance. Um, it seems a little difficult to make jump from there to other guys who are talking about factor analysis in the same series and are using the results from questionnaires, which uh, now renamed responses on the same level as those things emitted during the course of the experiments with rats or something. And um, there is a notable exception. This would be a Skinner who actually produced an extraordinary good paper on the subject in which is simply a personal account of how he came to be a psychologist hmm. and uh, how he did careful experiments. Uh, and um, how certain criteria were required in order to look at behavior, and he, he was considered looking at behavior. And that's that. Uh, and he wasn't particularly concerned with psychological relevance yeah. in that author. Uh, and um, it's, a, it's simply a personal history, really, uh, with you know, details of very nice experiments done along the way, and very nice methods and technology, techniques of experimentation. He has little use for statistics. Uh, he finds them usually inaptical, um, in contrast to some of his pals who are very keen on statistics, either applying them to sequences of trial, or in a Linden so called experiment, or applying them to um, uh, various dimension vectors which they muck around with. Look about the variance absorbed in each of the variables or something over a statistical measure. One means or another do an analysis of variance or a factor analysis and rotate their factors and things out. Or Osgood with a semantic differential, which is simply a series of questions asked along uh, things loading, questions loading onto the factors and you crunched it out from the machinery. 
and uh, it's very nice. I have a respect for Osborne. He's great. As a matter of fact, it does tell you something, but the statistics doesn't help a great deal in doing so. And um, yeah, it's very useful in certain types of product selling only. A uh, very limited range of products can be uh, useful. You can use to predict how, how well they will sell compared to another product and use various own attributes of the product. Um, and uh, in that area, I mean, it is great, and in certain more sort of serious academic kind of areas, it's great too, but uh, it ain't much of psychology. Well, this, however, this other paradigm book, I, I think Psychology the Study of the Science is one paradigm book in the field, um, edited by Koch. They're all edited by Koch, and Sigmund Koch, and they're excellent, really excellent book. But as I say that one not a, I don't see a very few of them, exception of Harlow, if you like that. And some of the people who are discussing emotions or doing historical overviews and things of this kind are very, very useful. And Skinner, Skinner's paper on method and his own personal history, the same paper, is very, very good. Um, now we're referring to the. Oh, there he is around there. I get up with him. Guys, at all, either case. We uh, are concerned with mathematical psychology. This is really you know, deep stuff. Well, the greater part of the second volume is occupied with papers with, uh, by Chomsky and Miller, or just Chomsky. And it is concerned with what kinds of string of symbols can be produced by a variously restricted automaton? Uh, and uh, they start off with, I think, a finite state machine, and they go on to various uh, Turing machines, restricted Turing machines, Turing machines with several tapes that are have reducible to one Turing machine with one tape. What they don't consider is something I once asked a guy to do at uh, Georgia Tech. And he did it for his master's thesis. It was rather fun. He made several Turing machines on one tape. The results were interesting. You can either interpret it as garbage or an identity crisis. <laughs> <laughs> And if you interpret an identity crisis, there's a very good sense in which you've got uh, a real advance uh, of the kind von Neumann asked for in computer science. But they carefully avoid that one. Having done that, for elegance's sake, uh, they, they say um, there's no easy way of writing down what does happen. I mean, give a definite number of explications to most of it. Um, they don't really, it doesn't contain anything by Lofgren, which is, I think, not an omission of the editors so much as the fact that Lofgren's work was not widely known at that stage. So that would have been, I think, of psychological relevance, although Lofgren would have been the first to agree, I think, that it had at that stage little proper interpretation in psychology and was chiefly of mathematical interest, but nevertheless any mathematically inclined psychology should pay attention to it. Last I worked for Heinz for a while, a long while, but he and I used to go visit the Biological Computer Lab, opt-in. I, I, I was inclined to go there fairly short intervals very frequently, and Lars used to go there once a year for a somewhat longer interval usually. And, um, it uh, therefore doesn't contain anything about the advances other than Burke's admirable but in a way a lamentable dilution of von Neumann's work and the work of others on on cellular and tessellation automata. Um, then his synthesis in cellular automata actually of, of more but still omitting the original uh, von Neumann stuff, I mean, you know, you know he, he, he had the notes of Johnny von Neumann's lectures at Illinois on self-reproducing automata. And the University of Illinois Press self-reproducing automata, von Neumann, is edited by Burks. And Burks, in that, actually makes intelligible for that particular age and that particular climate 
uh, ideas which, in the process of being made intelligible, are rendered uh, degenerate. In fact, uh, he um, looks at the Turing representation chiefly, the tessellation model to some extent. He really doesn't look at the generalized self-reproducing system or pose the conundrum except in the footnotes, which are as yeah. interesting as a book. <laughs> in the um, cellular automata, it does a bit more. But let's return to this lamentable state of psychology, which surely is concerned with language. This, this is all about language. This is a psychologist, a mathematical psychologist's view of language. And it's all about how bleeding hypothetical constructs called finite state or non-finite state automata um, can emit strings of symbols. When I ask what is the psychological relevance of this, what is the linguistic relevance of this? I mean, it allows me to say, for example, that um, it would seem rather difficult to have a, a context-free system other than an arbitrary writing system which would conceivably utter uh, a sentence. <laughs> but <coughs> the, um, then suddenly we're going to jump into people who are uttering sentences, and we have things about passive transformation, you see. And um, this is very neat. It, it explains very well how if you had a mechanism of entirely different kind, which isn't mentioned at all amongst all this stuff, um, but it's just a transformation role, it is possible that if somebody did issue an active sentence, the dog bit the man or something, it might be transformed into the man was bitten by the dog, or the dog was bitten by the man, or whatever. And, you know, I mean, it is a, it's very pretty, it does do that very well. But you have to take for granted that the production schemes, and there are ordered rules and the rest of it, which are otherwise just going to emit strings of symbols, are in some way regulated. And there are really allusions to the mental processes that do that, but absolutely nothing is said about them mathematically. Now, this is what I mean by formal linguistics. And uh, it is perpetrated by a leading psychologist and a leading linguist. So you're, you're suggesting that, that uh, if I understand you, that Chomsky's and his followers focusing on the transformations of sentences of one utterance into the other has rather missed the point of where an utterance comes from in the first place? Well, it's completely missed. And I, I mean, I don't think they deny this because when they're actually talking as linguists, they, 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 they don't really try to. They, they just uh, have no account at all of the mathematical mechanism, mathematical mechanism. They talk a little bit about the mathematical neatness of the transformation rules of a kind they, which they, would. They, they, by taking for granted the deep structure of the sentence, that, that, the, uh, that where the deep structure of the sentence comes from is so completely. Well, not only. Relevance yeah. If you don't talk about where the deep structure comes from. Yes, where the deep structure comes from. That's that is actually the best part of Chomsky is the deep structure in the in in uh, uh, syntactic uh, systems, whatever it's called, syntactic structures, uh, where he's quite respecting Saussure so and so on and this kind of tradition and endeavouring to formalise a good deal of the kind of thing they were talking about and you know, add to it, indeed, in particular, to add the transformational idea. Uh, There's a particular reason why I, I suggest that. Uh, Paul and I were having a discussion mm -hmm. about whether or not in, say, one of these caste teaching systems that we have running about here, mm -hmm. what it was that the English text that you got was. Mm -hmm. Uh, what within the context of conversation theory that text was supposed to represent. And the particulars were, uh, is that text, in some sense, a faithful representation, in the physicist's sense, or the mathematician's sense, a faithful representation of the coherence, or what is it if it is not the coherence itself? And I argued the point that I did not feel that any particular text would necessarily represent the coherence. If mm -hmm. I was representing the coherence 
that I might utter in the sentence, cats eat mice, mm -hmm. if I tried to say that that was a coherence, cats eat mice, uh, mice are eaten by cats, and the eatables of cats are mice, are three ways of expressing the same relationship. Those three ways are related by Chomsky-like transformations. In other words, they're not the same. Well, they're, they, what I would have said was that they are, what they are, that the coherence. The coherence it in is them. the deep structure of those things. It probably is. Uh, it probably that, is that in some sense. Each one of yeah. those represents a, a in other words, that, that, is, that is allowing what I think is due to Chomsky, that is to say to distinguish between the deep structure of a possible syntactic utterance yes. and the varieties of syntactic utterances that could be generated from the deep structure. So yeah. I was suggesting that, in fact, when we have a text demonstration of the coherence, what we have is not the coherence, oh, no, but a uh, sort of a Chomsky-like transformation has been applied to coherence to produce an English text. I would first to agree with you. And, and, and I wondered whether or not that, that was... Uh, I would entirely agree with that sentence. Yeah. What we have when we have a text... Well, it's a transformation, but it's Chomsky-like, we could discuss well, I think but, probably but is. It is a Chomsky-like transformation of a coherence, yeah. Chomsky transformations are, yeah. are, are a subset yeah. of the transformations yeah. that go from a coherence yeah. to the statement of it. Sure. In particular, another way of saying it, if I sure. can, since this is, this is sort of now parenthetical, this is now... Uh, is that, in a certain sense, uh, what cats eat mice is, is a particular pruning of the coherent relationship. Because the Chomsky yeah. transformation yeah. Yeah. has moved cats to the top of that pruning. It has indeed done, yes. And, and so that, that, that the two notions of the linguistic transformations and the other notions of prunings and the like from a conversation theoretic structure, mm -hmm. uh, some of those things seem to me maybe are the same or are related. They're, very very, say, they're very, very similar. And, that, that, um, that yeah. Some of the transformations that Chomsky would term linguistic yeah. or transformational grammar transformations may be related to, or analogous to, or something or other, to the same sort of transformations that represent one pruning of a mesh or another. They are very similar. Um, and I'm not sure whether they're identical, but that some of the issues that are involved in implementing a, uh, a Chomsky transformational grammar into a machine, or into uh, something or other, those formalist relationships, uh -huh. seem to me that some of the difficulties there are the same as some of the difficulties of implementing a conversation theoretic uh, retrieval system of some information. That is to say, let me add one final point, that having entered into the machine in a cast authoring system, for example, the coherence cats eat mice, it would be pleasant, although very difficult, to be able to retrieve mice are eaten by cats if what the focus of what the person was trying to learn was about mice. In other words, if he was thinking about mice preferentially. You see, we can't quite do that. We can't, we don't, when we do a prune on, on those things. It won't produce are eaten by. Yes, or are eaten by. And you say it won't produce the are eaten won't, by. In other words, the way we have it now, in other words, but if, as well as the other transformations, the other machinery uh -huh. that we could put on a mesh, we had a transformational grammar machine, it would be able to, if, some, if we had stored cats uh -huh. eat mice, Yes. In, in our yes. mesh, yes. in our primitive linguistic manner, yes. right. that if someone was asking to have mice taught to him, that the more useful way of retrieving okay. that would be mice are eaten by yeah. cats. Yeah. Do you want to comment yeah. on that, Gordon? Yeah, I think so. The difficulty is that the uh, transformation would have to be, would have to build in the whole order preserving bit, which is perfectly possible, but uh, it would be quite laborious to do. You couldn't do it. Um, the point is that you won't preserve in a pruning order, because an order in the in the Chomsky tree will not be preserved in the pruning. You will get, in fact, a, a pruning will represent a variety of Chomsky trees, and often it will, uh, there will be Chomsky trees which it represents that aren't there. So you would have to put in transformations from active to passive form, for example, of words in a sentence, mm -hmm. positions in a sentence, which are allowed and others are disallowed, and then prune that. Let's pursue this. And then that would actually tomorrow. come out. Uh, really good uh, yeah. to it would come out. No, excellent. Oh, it would. Well, I was going to just jump in and say that you're leaving me, and I'm sure all the people who want to read through the magazine in the dark at the moment, because mm. uh, I don't know what the cast machine is or how I've got to mm -hmm. what people yes. have done on it or a whole lot of things mm. which are 
directly relevant to what we'd like to talk about. Well, I think that's one of the things when we talked about the structuring, perhaps, of articles with parallel discussions. I mean, it's almost, a, I, you know, we, well, we, we, have, a, we, have, to, we have to have a... Let me, let me propose see, that we... What I'm sort of complaining about, Joe, I'm sorry. Let me just propose that we, we... I'll read you the second of Heinz's questions, because it's directly in this conversation. It's something that will focus, perhaps, a useful way of going at it from the bottom up. Mm -hmm that will allow us all to have that discussion mm -hmm. and participate in it at the moment. I can't do anything but, but hear it in a, in a sort of distant way. Hein says, Gordon's once constructed a machine called CAST, which I want mm -hmm. you to tell us about, mm -hmm. in order to study learning strategies. Mm -hmm. Now with CAST, I associate two things. One is the concept, which is behind CAST, and the other is the machine implementation. Mm -hmm. It would be wonderful to have Gordon now go through the concept of CAS. Mm -hmm. The root of the concept is something called an entailment structure. Mm -hmm. If he were now to go very carefully through the notion of an entailment structure, which he understands completely, who is entailed by whom? How is it in the notion of the past concept represented? In which way is the learner interacting with the entailment structure? which is the basis of the past learning, studying mechanism. What is, step by step, the procedure of the guy who is sitting in front of the machine? And then he offers a warning. He says, but watch the distinction between the machine and the concept. Don't let Gordon go too fast into the machine and lose the concept. All right. Good. Good. Uh, a little more. Now, if we have that, we should have the very important distinction between the lumpers and the stringers within the cast concept and complex. How do these strategies manifest themselves? Serialists and holists, lumpers and stringers. Well, lumpers and stringers should be explicated the same thing. Yeah. very clearly because they unfortunately disappear completely in Gordon because he is already jumping into the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's an awfully good program and, and, we, and yeah. it fits in with what we were going to do today, which is to remain anecdotal before getting into the sort of the theoretical discussions later. So well, this, this is my question, really, based on that as a jump off point. How far do we go as a background before conversation theory using CAST as the thing? That was, is CAST too far to go, and do we need to do that on Friday anyway? Or are there things before CAST that make the bridge so that we can postpone until There are things before that experimentally, at least, which make the bridge. And maybe I could do that, uh, though I think we should go into a sort of outline, perhaps, and maybe even recap it, of uh, what comes next. Because although Heinz is right in saying I'll go beyond me into machinery, or go beyond me um, present, uh, the, the thing that is meant to be presently discussing the things of the future, it's still quite a good idea to, to look at what's emerged, uh, as well as looking at where it emerged from, to some extent, compare them. And with um, pictures as often as that would be helpful. Right here. Uh, so, I mean, I hope it's clear that on the critique I was making of Chomsky, is not that I don't think, I, you know, I think Chomsky's a damn good formalist, and also a damn good linguist. But in my sense, he's not a formal linguist. Mm -hmm. He hasn't formalized language. Because I he, think he's he, both a damn good linguist and a damn good formalist, and he's very facile at talking about automata. He's very facile at playing around with with, with um, George Miller in respect to uh, communications, ecology, which is Miller's field chiefly, with these darn things. He's very good at his own transformational rules applied to real utterances in a particular kind of language. But he lacks the ontology of the, of the way the utterance but is he, uh, he doesn't lack it. He has it in a different yeah. part of his mind. Yes, and he never brings them together. Yeah, they never come point, together. I, I, yeah. to, to bring mm -hmm. these last remarks back, isn't that, that is what your critique is. You could, the, the, base, the basis of the criticism is to some extent that the that the uh, that the logic of the transformation yeah. grammar is all well and good, yeah. Yeah. but it requires the existence of the deep structure of the utterances already, yeah, and, it, and it doesn't address where they come from. Needs to say what in the world the utterances are mm -hmm. in the first place. It in no way says what language is. It, 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 and so so he, he has something that manipulates utterances yeah. Yeah. and relates them to primitive 
more primitive structures, mm. but the primitive structures themselves are left hanging. They're uh, entirely uh, left hanging. In fact, it's, left ontologically, they're it's, they're it's ontologically unclear mm -hmm. in all of all of Chomsky's stuff. Whether he has a sort of genetical view, like Piaget, for example, whether his epistemology is of this kind, or whether indeed he has a kind of, of spiritual view or um, societal view. All of which are perfectly acceptable. I mean, I don't mind the least degree. He's not clear himself. But in talking in choir psychologists and linguists, he's somehow got to bring these together if he's going to do so. Mm -hmm. And people speak language and they do linguistic things. And some of these things, particularly spoken utterances in English or languages like English, it happens that Chomsky's rules are very good rules and they're very pretty. Um, but uh, I mean, what in the world have they got to do with language actually has spoken? I mean, apart from saying how you can take sentence forms, transform as well. Uh, it's not that Chomsky doesn't know about language. He is a very capable linguist. He's a very humane and extremely widely read and found person. But um, it's, um, It's a sort of irrelevant plastering, as though, you know, this, uh, these are a body of psychologists in this bloody great tone, um, who happen to do bits of automata theory, or happen to do bits of transformational logic, or mm -hmm. happen to do bits of syntax of English, or whatever, mm -hmm. on the side, as it were. And what in the world it all has to do with psychology, let alone mathematical psychology, I just don't know. Because it doesn't address the ontological roots no. of language itself. No. You used you, uh, only a pistol. You used a, a second a minute ago uh, with reference to how Chomsky might be processing these things. You said, "Is he spiritual or some sort?" Mm -hmm. That's not. How do you mean that? In, in distinction, well, he might believe that the the essence of language was rooted in a god or several gods or a collective norm. I would have absolutely no objection to this view, if you were to state it, and uh, in somehow demonstrate it. Um, I certainly don't object to the view, uh, but, you know, it isn't clear what view he's taking. Is it due, due to genes, or if so, what are the genes, that, how, how are they related? And uh, Piaget would have sort of argued for genetic determinism, that people have a kind of inborn capability to acquire language, and that this is is caused in some sense, in a very remote sense, by a genetic, genetically transmitted uh, precursor. Again, a view I'm you know, quite willing to subscribe to, if, if, if again it is supported, I'm afraid. Um, it might be that this came out of a sort of young and unconscious. It might be that it, came, it is given by God to every person. Or it might be it is given by several gods to every person. Uh, none of these do I find the least degree objectionable, but it's not clear what the status of language is in, in Chomsky. I, I and which, which of these or any other views, I can have myriad views, I don't mind, I'm not